Uh, I'm just going to uh, very quickly introduce our speakers and then we'll move right into the uh, conversation. I want to um, maybe give one more minute for people who are just dialing in. I see that uh, we have a number of people already on, but uh, a few still joining us. Um, by way of brief introduction, uh, at the end of 2007 and beginning of 2008, uh, there were record uh, global food prices. Um, and that uh, food price spike led to over 100 million additional people being added to the ranks of the global uh, food insecure. Uh, the prices came down subsequently, um, but spiked again in uh, January of 2011 at an even higher level. Um, and it's widely believed that um, this mo most recent price spike contributed to the food riots in uh, countries of North Africa and the Middle East that uh, destabilized uh, regimes in that part of the world. In response, the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, has organized a committee on food security that has been meeting in Rome since 2008 to try to uh, assess the causes of this new situation of global um, uh, instability in food, market, uh, in food markets and high prices and to come up with solutions. And an import of, important part of that process was a, a report uh, commissioned this last spring um, to look into uh, the causes of high and volatile global food prices. Uh, we have with us two members of the uh, group that developed that report, which was released earlier this summer. And um, uh, I would, I'm really ha happy to uh, be able to welcome them both. Um, the first speaker will be Sophia Murphy. Sophia has worked with IATP's trade and global governance team since 1997. She joined us from Geneva, where she had worked for two years with the United Nations non-governmental liaison surface, and before that, worked as a policy officer with the Canadian Council for International Cooperation in Ottawa. She has a degree in politics, philosophy, and economics from Oxford University, and a master's from the London School of Economics in social policy and planning in developing countries. Her work focuses on agricultural trade rules, US trade and agricultural policy, and the interests of developing countries in the multilateral trade system. Um, Sophia is going to start with an introduction to uh, the process that developed this report um, and the um, Committee on Food Security. So I hand it over to you now, Sophia. Thank you, Jim. I'm just... Uh, okay. I'm just learning the technology here. Um, Sorry. So I wanted to just go through um, briefly some of the me mechanics of it all so that it made sense to people and have been well focused on what the report actually had to say. Um, so situating the high-level panel, then looking at next steps. Um, with the two parts, but I'll come back to the next steps after Benoit has made his presentation. Um, and so first you need some acronyms probably to navigate the next hour. Um, some are obvious, but they're all useful and we'll be using them. Uh, maybe not everyone knows them. The high-level panel of experts is the HLPE, the Committee on Food Security, the CFS, and the CSM. Uh, the civil society mechanism, which is quite an important new component of, of what's going on in Rome with this particular committee. And then I've listed the three other UN organizations that jointly um, provide the budget and are kind of, uh, from the UN side, the organizational oversight for this Committee on Food Security. In its new incarnation, as of 2009, it has this um, three UN organizations um, working on food who have to coordinate what they do for the CFS. So I'm sorry for the quality of the picture you have before you, but I was trying to illustrate in some way. It's hard to do flow diagrams. Everything seems to go one way, and I wanted to do something more interactive. But this is how it came out. On the um, far right of the screen, then, you have the high-level panel 
which is one of a number of institutions that the Committee on Food Security has um, working with it. The Bureau is a typical UN thing. It's the way the governments coordinate by having a smaller subset of the government membership make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis and meet probably every couple of months. The CSM is that civil society mechanism where civil society is providing people to participate. And then you have this advisory group, um, which is quite a new thing um, and, is, and is providing substantive input, can initiate ideas as well as review what's going on. And the composition now is, is um, um, before you on the screen. It involves UN organizations, four positions for CSOs, which you can see is quite a lot in relation to some of the other kinds of institutions that are represented. So these are some of the mechanics of the, um, the committee. The high-level panel itself is made up of these 15 experts from around the world. It took quite a while to get it um, organized and appointed, but over the, the year last year, 2010, it, it came together and met for the first time. It's meant to provide this independent expert advice. It's supposed to provide a way for the governments to have a little bit of political cushion, if you like, so that they can hear what experts are saying and not filter it through what governments are willing to say for themselves. Um, so it's a new and experimental body. And this report that we've done on price volatility is one of the first two reports that the high-level panel has been responsible for. The panel is responsible this is the, from its formal mandate to assess and analyze food security and its underlying causes. And I put that in bold because it's important that this isn't just about um, hunger, directly related to hunger issues, but it, there's a mandate to look at the economic and political power structures that we all know um, underlie um, food security and nutrition. It's meant to work with existing research and data. So this was to say this isn't going to start new work, but it's meant to pull together and work with existing research, much like the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Identify the emerging issues and prioritize future actions. So there are two, two tiers, two, two levels of the structure. There are the 15 experts, and then they um, select and manage project teams. And Benoit and I worked with um, Shahidur Rashid from IFPRI and uh, Nango Dembele from the State University of Michigan, based um, in Mali, as four members of a project team. And we're chosen, we were chosen to write this specific report on price volatility. And as a project team, we're part of the high-level panel. But our, our work with the panel ends when the report is um, completed. So I think there are a few things that are important about the high-level panel. It's new and experimental. As I say, it has hardly had time to go through even one cycle of its work yet to see how it will um, perform. It's at arm's length from government. It has this important place for civil society views. The composition of the project team also chosen to reflect um, a civil society perspective. Um, it acknowledges alternative knowledge, so there was a lot of discussion about, you know, does it have to be written in English and published in an academic journal to be knowledge? And quite a strong push from the CSOs to say no, and it's quite difficult in practice. We can maybe talk a bit more about that later on, but, but the, the idea that we should look at different kinds of knowledge systems is a, um, written into the mandate for the high-level panel. And so hopefully, and I think we'll see successfully, we're meant to be pushing governments beyond their comfort level. Jim, I'm going to stop there. I've just got some information that people can have when they get a copy of the PowerPoint later. All right. Thanks. Um, uh, I, I just want to quickly ask if there are any clarifying questions people have. There's a, I know we've been getting a, a few bigger picture questions for after the, all the presentations are over coming in. But if uh, there was anything in Sophia's initial remarks that people need clarification on, um, feel free to um, type those in. Um, not receiving any, I want to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Benoit Daviron is a senior researcher at CIRAD, which is uh, the Center for Cooperation on uh, International uh, Agricultural Research for Development, uh, based in Montpellier, France. He is a co-author of the Coffee Paradox, uh, Global Markets, Commodity Trade, and the Elusive Promise of Development, and has published widely on uh, issues of food policy, uh, trade in agricultural commodities, 
as well as tropical commodity chains, international agreements, and agriculture in developing countries. Uh, he's published papers in many peer-reviewed journals, including Journal of Agrarian Change, Development Policy Review, and the Journal of Global History. And perhaps most importantly for today's purposes, he was the team leader uh, for the report on uh, volatility uh, that we are discussing today. So let me hand it, hand it over to Benoit. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everybody. So I am I, I'm going to try to present briefly the, the main conclusions and recommendations of the HLP report. Uh, I will do it in, in three parts. First one is about what is exactly the problem with, with the price behavior during the last uh, few years. And I will try to present you the different explanations we, we, we tried to deal with and then the various recommendations we, we, we included in, in the report. So first, the first discussion actually we, we, we had and we had also with the steering committee was exactly what, what is the problem with prices, with the prices and and so if you look at the, at, the, at the behavior of the prices during the last 20 years, you, you can clearly see that, that w w we had a big spike of prices in 2007-2008, then a decline of the prices during the financial crisis, and very quickly after the financial crisis when growth came back at the world level, the price started again to, 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 to increase. What is important also to, to consider is that the spike we knew in, in, in 2007-2008 actually happened after almost five years of continuous increase in international food prices. And this is something quite important in, in our point of view. And if you look at, at the, the, the behavior of prices in constant terms, I mean, uh, without inflation, that is the, the red line on, on this graph, you can see that uh, the, what happened recently with, with international food prices is quite different of the previous food crisis and most, most specifically the food crisis we knew in, in the 70s. In the 70s, the price spike was very brief and happened after uh, a decline in international food prices. And just after the, the price spike, international food prices restart to decline. Uh, now it's very different, and the, the two spikes we knew recently happened in a, in, a, in, a, in a global, in a general movement of increasing prices for, for, for food commodities. So it's a reason why we push a lot during the, during the, the, the work to, to deal not only with volatility, but also with, with rising prices. Uh, because clearly for us, uh, the, the recent price behavior shows the existence of, of uh, upward pressure. And that, that provokes simultaneously higher and more volatile prices. And maybe more importantly, it is high prices and rising prices that, is, that are creating problems at the world level for, for world food security and not that much price volatility. And uh, importantly also, in our view, it was very important to not be, be locked in the debate about volatility. Because actually, if you look at the debate in international institutions and most of the government during the last 20 years, they have been discussing about price volatility, food price volatility, and promoting always the same package of solution, of solution, the same solution package. I mean, market liberalizations, market-based risk management instruments, and social safety net. And the risk was, if you, you one more time you consider that the, the problem now is price volatility is to, to to, to, to get the same and always the same package of solutions. And in our view, uh, the problems are quite different today and need a more open debate than the one we, we had during the last 20 years in relation to the kind of solutions that can be implemented in terms of policy, policy solutions. So now, quickly, because I, have, I don't have a lot of time, but the, the three kind of explanations or three kind of narrative we, we're trying to, 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 to discuss in our report um, in, in relation to the, the, the interpretation of the, of the causes of, 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 the, of the price behaviors. The first one and the, the dominant one in a certain way is to, 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 to always speak of in terms of price volatility, what I just said right now. And things that, in a certain way, volatility is a normal situation on, on food markets. It's a permanent and structural characteristic of food markets. 
and maybe that two days of parallel is just that threat it is, is too strong and could be maybe excessive. I, I, I will come back quickly on, 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 on every of this, each of, of, this, of this explanation. Well, the second big narrative is, is in terms of crisis and cyclical crisis, saying that in international food market you have periodic cyclical food crisis and that is th this crisis are very related to the, the, the dynamic of investment, public and private investment in agriculture. And lastly, the last narrative is in terms of scarcity and saying that what we see on the international food market in a certain way is the early signal of, of a coming and lasting scarcity on agricultural market and related to the increasing pressure placed on, on natural resources. So now coming back to this different narrative and trying to be not too long. So uh, uh, around this first narrative, uh, interpreting food prices in terms of just excessive volatility, actually we discussed in the report three, three, three variables, three, three causes. The first one is the question of what economists call price elasticity. Uh, it means that the, the sensitivity of food consumption to price fluctuations. What is very frequently say about food market is that price elasticity on food market, consumption price elasticity is very low. It means that people are not reacting a lot to, to, to fluctuation in prices. And what we point out in the report is that that relation between the behavior of consumers and, and the fluctuation of the prices depend on the level of incomes of, of, of the consumers. And the, the richer the consumer, the less sensitive they are to, to the price fluctuation. This is important because on, on, on the on a one hand, because the world income is increasing continuously, it means that the, the, the world food consumption is less and less sensitive to price fluctuation on the one hand. On the other hand, it, it means also that the, at the world level today, most of the adjustments, the quantitative adjustments of, on international food market is, uh, is taking, taken into, into a charge, it is, is taken by, by the poor consumer in the, in the world. The richer are not reacting to price fluctuation and the, the poor have to, to react and to adjust the quantitative uh, consumption to the price fluctuation. But the second variable, the very discussed on, 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 on the characteristic of international food market is the question of fragmentation of the international food market. But price fluctuation has very frequently interpreted in terms of in relation to, 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 to the structure of international food market, saying that international food market are, are residual market. It means that uh, in most of the country, this supposed to be that the situation is supposed to be that domestic prices are not linked to international prices. Actually, this is less and less true because of the WTO negotiation, because of, of the structural adjustment program in developing countries. More and more countries are now have now their domestic prices very linked. To international prices. But what we saw during the crisis is a very strong and, and quick reaction of many countries in front of rising prices and trying to isolate their domestic market and protecting, trying to protect their consumer for the rising prices on international, on international market. And we saw it mostly in, in the rice market, for example, where countries like China, India, or Thailand actually put restriction on exports to protect their consumer for the rising international market. So we have today a more integrated market but with government very ready and many governments ready to, to isolate uh, and to, 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 to in a certain way to, to, to change the, the, the trajectory of liberalizations to, to, to abandon the, 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 the liberalizations process to protect their consumer for, 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 from the international domestic situation, international prices situation. Well, last and very sensitive point is the question of speculation on international on future market. Everybody agree on on, 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 on the fact that future market knew a very uh, so, so the, the arrival of, of massive quantity of, of, of capital of, of, of money recently during the 10, 10, last ten years. But actually, there is a lot of debates, and some people clearly say that. This, this money is really responsible for, 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 the, for, for the rising prices, 
and that the, the rising prices are actually the result of financial bubbles on future markets. Other uh, observers, other analysts, uh, contest this diagnostic and say that actually there is no clear relation, not at all relation, be between this uh, new capital arriving on, on future market and the rising prices. So this is, there is clearly a controversy and it's quite sensitive controversy on, on this point. What we add in the report is to look at exactly if uh, this uh, massive quantity of money acting now on future market are decreasing uh, the cost of, of, of using this future market to, to, to protect uh, traders or to protect farmers uh, against the price risk price, the, 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 the risk generated by, by price fluctuations. And actually, what we saw is that uh, there is no decline in the, in the cost of, of using future market. And at the contrary, the cost of using market seems to be increasing, which is totally contrar contrary to, to the, the, the dominant discourse saying that more money on future market is giving more liquidity and then decreasing the cost of using future market. Uh, the second narrative so, is in terms of cyclical crisis, so uh, quite simple reasoning saying that when prices are high, people are investing in agriculture, government are investing, and then uh, more production is arriving on the market, then prices are declining, and then with the decline of prices, people are less investing, and government are less investing, and then preparing a new period of, of, uh, of scarcity on market, and then new high prices, a new period of high prices, and then a new cycle of investment or in their investment. Well, actually, the, the, the rice market and the stocks, no, not rice, sorry, the corn market and the, the evolution on, of stocks on the corn market seems to be, to, to be demonstrate the existence of such cycles. Now you can see on this, on this figure the evolution of stocks at, at the world level measure in terms of percentage of the world consumption and you see clearly a very nice cycle uh, starting from the 60s to, 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 the, to the years 2010 and with, with a decline of stocks and an increase of stock and, and a new decline of stocks in the 90s and, and 2000s. Right. It works very well with corn actually and this is the reason why I'm showing the, the graph for, for corn. It's, it works much, much less for, for wheat or for rice. Well, so it exists in a certain way. It's a cycle uh, 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 considering the, the evolution of the stocks at the world level. You can see it also in, in terms of production of cereal production per capita at the world level. H here you can see that clearly in the, in the 80s and 90s a decline or a, a very slow growth and even a decline of the, of the production of cereal per capita at the world level. Actually it was mostly related to the crisis in, in the previously Soviet Union and, and Eastern country, socialist Eastern country, Eastern Europe country. But you see also, and contrary to this vision of, of, a, of a food crisis related to a lack of production at the world level, that the production of cereal is increasing now, is increasing now, for per cap, the production per capita is increasing for the last, has been increasing for the last almost six to seven years. So it's not exactly fitting with, with, with this idea of a cyclical crisis of, of, of production. And even more, and I guess it's important in, in, in the, the current debate, and even more in, in relation to the debate uh, organized by the G20 on, on, on the international food market, that if you just look at the, the, the line re, 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 related to the so, so food production per capita at the world level, this is the data are about the, 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 the rate of growth of food production at the world level per capita. And you see that during the last decade, actually, the, the food production per capita has been quite good. The rate of growth is, is, is the best one we, 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 we added for the last 50 years. So there is no such, such a, 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 a crisis of, of production. There is not such a crisis. I mean, there is a, maybe a little problem with cereal production, but, but not in terms of food production, generally speaking. And one more time, I guess it's important when you see a lot of people like the French government pushing a lot to say that we have to, 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 to push for more production, to push for a, a bigger growth of production. Well, last narrative is the idea that 
what we see on the international food market is an early signal of a long-lasting scarcity in agricultural markets. And it, well, the idea is to say that the 20th century in the second end was characterized by, by a structural overproduction, a structural overproduction that, that was um, permitted by, by the mining of natural resources and, and mostly of also of fossil energy, uh, fossil energy permitting to, to allowing the, the, the production of low-cost fertilizer, uh, allowing the use of low, low, low um, of, of mechanization. Uh, so, so uh, 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 finally, a uh, uh, very specific situation during the 20th century, a situation of structural overproduction, but that was really based on on, uh, on, on the mining of natural resources. Uh, and what we see now is clearly maybe two, two, two big changes in relation to this situation. The first one is that we see with, for the moment with biofuels, but that could be a, a bigger movement in a certain way, is an ongoing, an ongoing move toward a biomass-based economy. What, what, what it means is that during the 20th century in a certain way, biomass was used only for food, to produce food. And what is changing today is the, the, the end of this situation and the need to, to, to use biomass for much more things than just to produce food and to produce energy, first of all. And clearly, biofuel today is, has been, and the, the development of biofuel has been a very serious uh, issue and a very serious cause in, in the current situation of, of, food, of, food, of, food price, of food price price. If you look at the, at the consumption of cereal, for example, and com comparing the, 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 the consumption of the rate of growth of consumption, uh, taking into account uh, the use of cereal for, for biofuel and without biofuel, you see that there is quite a big difference, 0 0.5% in the, the rate of growth between the consumption with biofuel and the consumption without biofuel, the last line in, in this table. 0.5% is something very important in terms of, of consumption at the world level and in, in terms of creating a situation of, of, of scarcity and of, of deficit on, on world market. The situation is even more uh, serious on, on the vegetable oil market and you see the, the two first lines, the difference of, in the rate of growth, taking into account the, the, the use of biofuel and not the use of biofuel. So with the use of biofuels, the, the growth of vegetable consumption is, is much more important. Well, um, sorry. Uh, so, and in, in our view, biofuel is just also the early signal of a, a, a bigger move of our economy toward a, a much bigger use of biomass for many activities and not just for food. It means a, a much bigger, a much stronger competition between food use and other use uh, regarding biomass at the world level. And the very last variable we discuss is the question of, of, of the growth of food production and, and the limit of the green revolution that, that supports the, the growth of world production during the last 40 years. Well, many, many, um, Many events, many many evolutions today are are signaling the, the limits of the green revolution. Limits in terms of genetic improvement, limits in terms of uh, natural resources, um, water, soil. Limits in terms of pollution of natural resources, also with nitrogenous pollution, for example. So many limits now are are, are very clear in relation to the the, the green revolution. So. We are today in a very tense situation with, on the one hand, uh, the development of new use of actual products, and on the other hand, very strong limits on the growth of production. So this, this will be the, the last narrative explaining the, the, the rising prices. So now if we go to policy option, if I still have five minutes, uh, we, 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 we develop uh, arguments around uh, five policy options. The first one, and I will just say the title, and maybe we can discuss it during the, the, the debate. The first one is the idea that we need to build a, a food system, an international food system, oriented toward food security, mm -hmm. insisting on the fact that during the last 
20 years, international negotiation on international food market were very oriented uh, in relation to, to, to a situation of, of overproduction at the world level and was very uh, exporter country oriented in a certain way, trying first to organize a competition between exporting countries and not taking into account the situation of importing countries and not taking into account the situation of the consumer. And that's the very issue now to take into account for the international negotiation is the, the situation of the consumer and to guarantee to, for the consumer the, the access to, to, to food market. Well, the second point is the question of speculation. And when we propose to take a, a, precautionary, a precautionary principle position, saying that there is a controversy about the consequences of, of uh, of, of speculation on price volatility, but at the same time there is no clear benefit in terms of risk management cost. So because there is no benefits and, and controversy, so it's, it will be more reasonable to take just a, a, a precautionary measure uh, to, take, to, to, to implement tiger, tighter regulations, at least as a precautionary measure. Uh, the third point is about storage policy. Everybody agree to say that a low level of, of stock is, is, a, is a necessary condition for, for, for high prices, for rising prices. It means also that a sufficient level of stocks will, 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 will be a, a sufficient condition for price stability. This discussion about stocks at the world level, it's a very sensitive one. And in a certain way, it's a forbidden debate. Many international institutions, many governments doesn't want, don't want to discuss about stocks at the world or national level. So we don't have uh, turnkey solutions to propose. We, just, we are just proposing a certain way to reopen debate that is today forbidden and to push to reopen a debate about the necessity maybe to coordinate at the world level the national storage policy. First, first proposal is it's in relation to the demand of food demand of developed country and just one more time maybe just pushing to open a debate that is today uh, forbidden in a certain way. But in, in most of the analysis, food demand is analyzed as some exogenous variables that cannot be questioned. We think that a debate can be organized on the crisis on the growth of, of food consumption in developed countries. Biofuel clearly uh, is a good opportunity to, to, to discuss about the consumption of, of actual products in developed countries, but a, a debate about meat consumption could be very also useful, uh, and more generally a, a debate about the, the way we consume actual products and food products could be very really useful, and may, maybe to, to solve the problem of international food markets. And last, uh, we also propose to, to discuss about uh, investment in agriculture, the need to, to reinvest in agriculture, but insisting on the fact that production growth should not be the priority. As we saw, production is, is not that bad. I mean, production growth is not that bad today. And what is most more important than growth is the necessity to, 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 to change the, the way agricultural production is organized today. To, to change the, the, the actual production systems uh, toward more sustainable production systems, to are less depleting natural resources. Well, so invest in agriculture not to, to increase the production, but to change the way we produce I, I, at the world level. And finally, and I will stop here, we also propose to, 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 to take the current crisis in the market maybe as an opportunity also to internalize a certain number of externalities, negative externalities of, of agriculture. I, I am thinking to the pollution, for example, by nitrogenous, and maybe to take the, the rising prices as an opportunity to introduce some form of taxation or something like that in relation to fertilizer to limit the, the pollution of created by fertilizers. Just an example, but the idea to take the crisis as an opportunity also to change our way to produce actual products. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Benoit. Now I want to put it back on Sophia to talk a little bit about the current state of play and some things that are happening moving forward. Thanks. 
um, Jim. I'll try and be quick. We we want to have time for questions, I'm sure. So I'll maybe um, uh, skip through some of my um, slides, but let's see if I do any better. I think the 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 key is um, where the report goes next. Um, and so um, the, the project team gives it to the high-level panel, which actually made some changes at the last minute, and then that was submitted to the, to the UN, to the CFS, to prepare background documents. And they had the high-level panel report. At the same time, the G20 had been meeting and discussing these similar issues, and FAO had organized regional meetings um, in every region except North America, because North America is not a region. Um, in the FAO, or it is a region, but it doesn't um, have the same structure of regional meetings that the rest of the world does. So the G20 is perhaps the key um, counterpoint to the high-level panel report in the government decision-making that is now ahead. The G20 Ministers of Agriculture met in Paris this June, and they had commissioned a report, I.O. there is for the international organizations, some eight organizations from the UN system and the World Bank, the WTO, the OECD, all contributed to a report. Um, and that covers very similar grounds, but it didn't look at the domestic causes of price volatility, just these international issues, which is what Benoit focused on now in his presentation as well. And there's been a clear push from some governments that the G20 outcomes, which I have to say were not particularly well received by anyone much, because there's a lot of difference among the G20 governments on what should be done about price volatility, and so a lot of very lukewarm, kind of not going anywhere kind of recommendations. But there were some strong statements, um, and there's a push to have that G20 outcome frame the discussion now for the CFS, and then some pushback to say, well, we've got this high-level panel, and they did just report. And um, of course, the report um, that Benoit and I were part of says um, quite different things on a number of these issues. And so there's been a bit of a, of a drama going on through the summer in Rome, and there are different versions of the, um, what the governments will do in October is see a background document prepared by the Secretariat, and there'll be what's called a decision box about what they'll do next. And I'll come to what that's saying, but that's the, the negotiation at the moment is, what should that decision box say? And the NGOs have had a voice, the CSOs have had a voice through this advisory mechanism that I had put up on the screen before. Two of the big things that the G20 did say they would do is, one, this AMIS, Agricultural Market Information System. They want to know more about what's happening, and they're hoping the private sector will cooperate. Um, a big hope, because the private sector has not been very forthcoming about its level of stock holdings and so on. That's very sensitive information. Um, and, a, and a feasibility study and pilot project for the World Food Program to coordinate to see how an emergency reserve might work. But on all the other issues that we've been looking at, such as biofuels, trade, um, reserve stocks in the sense of price stabilizing stocks, some kind of confidence building measure that there's enough supply in the market, and on speculation, there's been, um, the, the G20 failed to say anything except we're not going to change what we're doing. Um, and so those are all issues where um, there's, a, there's a fight to be fought to see what the governments will do. The draft decision box, um, I think you can get, uh, the last slide I have has some websites and there's one called uh, uh, CSOs for CFS and, and on there there's the latest draft document. Um, it's something ITP can put at its website too, can link at the website. The, the, the main thing is that they need to, the governments, this is now governments speaking, the proposal for governments to consider is whether they establish this process to review all these different component parts where the high-level panel report is one, and get to this action plan to address some core structural issues. Um, uh, the same draft decision box is proposing just to endorse the G20 report, which doesn't do much um, in the direction that we'd like to take it. This is me speaking as IATP now. Um, so, so we'll see what comes in October, but it's a chance to see whether this high-level report is going to be able to change the politics. I, I think it already has um, in, in the way that the um, negotiation for the background document in October has taken place, it's clear that the high-level panel report is introducing some ideas and some proposals that have, that have at least set governments talking. 
Jim, I'll hand back there. I think we should get to the questions. Yes, absolutely. And I'd like to thank both of our speakers for being succinct and um, having some great slides that people could also, you know, use to um, to take the information in. So we we have a good chunk of time to have questions and answers. Um, the first question, uh, and we have uh, quite a quite a queue to work from uh, of excellent questions. Uh, the first one is. Uh, is really a comment that uh, somebody would like a response to, uh, and it is, uh, Mr. Daviron said, price rise is the main problem for global food security. I disagree because farmers, who are half the world's population, benefit from higher prices, um, and therefore they are good for rural areas, food production, and thus for food security. Could you respond to that comment, please? Well, uh, this is a question of short short term and, and short term and long term in a certain way or medium term but uh, in in the short term high prices mean for many people and maybe mo mo mostly people living in in in, in town in, in poor country mean, means less access to food today everybody is, is is okay to say that food security is first first a question of access to food and with higher prices for people with low incomes, there is less access to food. To food. That's, that's just my, my, what I wanted to say. I mean, it's, it's not a question of the general agreement is a question of food security. is not a question of physical availability at the world level, but a question of access at the consumer level. So it's the reason why I'm insisting on, on, on the idea that for food security, the first problem is higher price and not volatility. But maybe Sofia could. All right. Um, uh, several questions. Um, we have several questions pressing you a bit further on the question of speculation, and just sort of one of them is sort of what percentage of uh, of increases can be attributed to speculation. Others just wanting you to elaborate a little more on on the debate and um, and perhaps uh, amplify what you said in your presentation. If I do it, Sofia, do you want to, to, to say something? I, I can do it, but Sofia. Um, no, I, I, you, <laughs> you go ahead, Benoit. I'll add if I... If I... Okay. 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 Well, so, uh, actually people contesting the, the, the idea that speculation is the cause, or the cause of, of price increase, is price rise, I think that uh, the, the, the arrival, the, the entrance of massive quantity of, of, of money uh, happened before the, 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 the rise of the prices. It happened mostly in the, the first, uh, between 2000 and 2005 or six, something like that, if I well remember. And so it was, pre it happened previously to, 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 the, to the rise of the prices. This is one of the arguments. They, they say also that, for example, uh, other commodities like rice, like I don't remember exactly the kind of commodity, but other commodity without future markets, so without this kind of financial speculation on markets, knew the same kind of of, of price rise. So, so that it is supposed to to show that that speculation will not be the, the financial speculation will not be the, the cause of, of, of price rise. Um, but actually, I'm absolutely not, not able to, 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 to say. On, on the other on the other hand, uh, what what should, what could be attributed to, to 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 financial speculation in terms of price rise? Um, well, Sophia. Yeah, I think that's right. That um, and it seems when you a lot of people are arguing about slightly different things, and so um, I, I I think it's happening, but there hasn't yet been. Um, a kind of meeting to say let's agree our terms in advance and then talk. At the moment it's a highly politicized debate where people making a lot of money from the system don't want it to change. People concerned about what that system is doing are trying to push for change and in the middle there's you know quite a lot of honest academic debate I think trying to set some you know you need a baseline from which to work and it's hard to set that. I, I think I would say that over the six to nine months that this report's been in process in some way the evidence becomes clearer that there are many problems with the lack of regulation of speculation. But tying that directly to the kind of discussion that's been about price volatility and 
what percentage of price change is caused by what factor. I don't know how far we'll get anyway down that line, but that, that still I think is all open. But I think at the same time, the problems created by the deregulation of the banking sector and the big commodity traders to allow so much speculation on commodity prices, it's beginning to become clearer that there are a lot of problems associated with that. And so I think it reinforces the high-level panel point that we want a precautionary approach. Thank you. We, we try to deplace a little the debate also to, to trying to say, well, show us demonstrators what are the benefits for, for, for the, the normal people, let's say, of, of financial speculation. Is there any benefit? And I guess that so far there is no clear demonstration that financial speculation is, is benefiting to, 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 to the own markets or to, to, the, to the operators of, of the market. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, a, that's an important contribution. Um, our next question is about um, the role of civil society organizations. Um, and the question is, uh, what's the power of those institutions, meaning civil society organizations, to convince governments, and especially international organizations, to follow their recommendations? I believe alternative knowledge is really not taken enough into consideration. Um. I, I, I would say, um, you know, it's a continuing political struggle. I don't think, I, I, if you go to the CFS now, if you're in Rome for a meeting of the Committee on Food Security and you're part of an organization which has um, requested, you know, you, you have to go through a process to be present, but it's not an arduous process. There are NGOs from all over the world there, farmer organizations, women's groups, you know, consumer groups. Um, you, and you work with the civil society coordinating mechanism, you're able to take the floor with the governments to make proposals and suggest amended amendments to text and there's a kind of place for civil society in this debate that I've never seen before at the UN and have followed UN processes for a very long time. I, I think there's always a problem with what governments promise and what governments do. I think there are interesting examples in other, in other spheres like Social Watch, it tracks what governments have committed to do about poverty and what they actually do. There are many models we can look at and learn from and expand. I, at the moment, I would say that the, the CSOs have quite a lot of um, power, potentially, but there's very little, there aren't enough you know, uh, feet on the ground to, to, to have the impact we could hope for. So there's access, um, but there's, it's difficult. A lot of organizations who care and work on food are working locally, sometimes nationally. They don't have a budget and the capacity to be um, interacting with Rome in some way, and that interaction is essential. But we do have a, a kind of um, skeleton framework with the civil society mechanism. There are regional representatives from every region, um, and there are also constituency delegates for youth and, as I say, for farmers, for women, environmentalists, and so on. And so there are a number of kind of people you could turn to to talk to, and the ideal is that we will be able to um, build up the website that's already there, um, work with people in regions and working with constituency groups. It'll always stay a little bit abstract at this multilateral level, but I think the possibility of, of, of local knowledge and alternative knowledge systems um, finding a place, there's an opening there, and we still need a lot of um, thinking and probably a lot of experimentation to see how best it can be incorporated. Next question relates to what Benoit referred to as, I think, the sensitive question of food reserves. The question is, what potential do you see for AMIS? Does it need and will it get information from China? Is it likely to be effective in moderating volatility? <laughs> this is a good question. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not very convinced by, by AMIS. On, 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 on the one hand, I, I'm not very sure that there is such a lack of information on the international food market. I mean, there is already a lot of sources of information. Maybe the problem is more to give the, the ability to people to, to, to use it. Um, on the other hand, uh, clearly, the information on stocks and, and, and the level of stocks is a very sensitive information for many governments. In, for the Chinese government, it's a very sensitive one. So I, I, and but also for for private traders, and so we have to to, to, to wait and see. But but 
I'm not sure after all that, that, that MS will, will have the, the ability, the, the capacity to, to, to get this information. And without this information, I mean, well, the, the work will be very, very less useful. All right. Next question. Is anyone addressing the historical role of policies that have aimed, and are still aimed, at stimulating global food insecurity? The entire economics of comparative advantage has driven third world countries out of food production and into cash cropping. All of West Africa's production space was reoriented during colonial rule, and even more so in the post-colonial decades, in this direction. It was the economic experts who drove these countries out of food production to specialize instead on cash crops such as coffee, cocoa, and bananas. Yes. I, I, actually, I, I, I don't really agree with this vision. Well, first of all, the, the evolution of production in, in the so-called developing country are, are very different, different from one country to another country. And, and second, I, actually, uh, the, the example of West Africa is a very good one because Agricultural production has been increasing at a very good rate of growth during the last 20 years, actually, in West Africa. This is something strange, maybe, but this is actually what, what, what the figures are, are telling us. Uh, and this is mainly related, certainly, to the, the urbanization process that happened in, in West Africa during the last 20, 30 years. With, with the urbanization, new markets for, for agricultural producers uh, happened and, and give opportunity for this producer to increase their production. So, so I don't have this such a negative vision of the situation in, in Africa. It's, not, it, it's very different in, in, in Southern Africa, it's very different in Eastern Africa, but in West Africa, well, the situation is quite good in a certain way. Even with the liberalization process, even with structural adjustment, actually the, the, the actual production uh, increase increase quite a lot during the last 20 years. Next question. Don't we need something similar to cultural goods obtained by the International Covenant for Promotion of Cultural Diversity? And that's to open new policy space for states that want to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to food and to decent revenues. As Bill Clinton said at the UN Assembly in October 2008, quote, we and I were wrong to treat food like color TVs, end quote. I, I think that, um, I think what happened in the food price crisis makes that very starkly clear, so that the governments who had been insisting on global trade as a solution to food security, many of them then started to, to limit or even ban the export of some of the food that they had been providing to international markets. And the G20 um, declaration in June says, you know, trade, well, the food, food is first of all a, a domestic, uh, um, you know, a, a national policy decision. Make, I think that um, the, the relocalization of it is, so it was forced by the crisis. In the crisis, as Benoit said in his presentation, people, you know, began to look for ways to cut themselves off or protect themselves from the world market. And the importing countries that didn't have much choice after 20, 30 years of following a course of increased dependence on international markets, were made very aware that the exporters were only going to export when the conditions were good. So the, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Olivier de Schutter, has been very active in the CFS and very present in the discussions going on, this, the, the land investment discussion, which has been a lot more heated and political than the price volatility one as well. And I think the human rights language is, is present in that discussion. You know, there's, there's the next step to make it real and to bring it down to a national and, and sub-national policy decision. But the human rights language, I think, is, is an accepted part of the discussion at CFS. Next question. Could greater coordination of the marketplace help poorer countries to take advantage of their own resources and contribute to the food supply, as opposed to having to compete with highly subsidized food products from richer countries? And if so, how do you improve the coordination of the marketplace, and would measures such as tariff measures be a legitimate tool to help poorer countries contribute to their own food supply?
Do I respond? Shall I? I mean, I, I think tariffs are, are, are legitimate. I think, um, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know what coordination means exactly. I, 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 uh, I, I think that, um, I think all of the work to try and improve the way that markets work, say, particularly in Africa, where there's a particularly dysfunctional, you know, partly this colonial legacy and um, a whole series of other factors make the markets very dysfunctional there. And um, political borders have very little to do with, with food production, you know, with the, the, the geography and the, and the ecology of, of food production. That, I mean, you, you see, um, so some attempts to increase regional trade um, makes a lot of sense, and there are attempts to do that. It's, it's a very difficult, painstaking process. Um, and in all of that, I, I mean, I, I mean, tariffs are obviously they're useful and they have a cost associated with them. There's not, it's not that they are any kind of magic. There's no magic much around the tariff, but it can be very effective. Um, and I think, I, I, but re, I don't know about exactly about what coordinating the markets would mean. But I think a lot of a lot more work to um, integrate those markets would make sense. Okay, and even more at the regional level as well. I was seeing Serbia in West Africa, for example, it's a very, very, very big issue. And for example, the crisis, the food crisis in Niger in 2006, if I remember, it was actually created by, by something that happened in Nigeria. But because the market are actually, the products are already circulating between both countries, some form of coordination will be very necessary to, to manage the, the, the food situation, food security. Thank you. All right, in the spirit of making this uh, as much like a dialogue as possible and not always giving the last word to our speakers, we have a response from one of the question askers um, uh, to uh, 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 Mr. Daveron's uh, uh, remarks about, um, about developing countries and colonial policies encouraging them to oh. become uh, exporters. Uh, the history of each country is different, of course. But the trends toward external dependence for foodstuffs is universal. Production may be, well have increased in West Africa, but so has dependence upon an external sources of food at an even faster rate. Urbanization is not an independent variable. Uh, people leave the countryside for urban centers when the food that they could produce in the villages is provided more cheaply by the grain surpluses dumped in the port city by large European and US grain pushers. This has been at the core of increasing food security. Um, uh, our next, and, and maybe you want to respond to that as well, but I, I have another question as well um, on the issue of biofuels. Um, why do you think governments, particularly in Europe, are so reluctant to go back on biofuel mandates, despite the environmental case for biofuels from crops now being so roundly defeated because of greenhouse gas emissions from indirect land use? Mm. On the European, European side, I guess that it is because biofuel actually is a way to support uh, farmers. It has been used as a, as a substitute to, to other form of subsidies and other form of support to, to, to farmer incomes. And I guess that this is just the reason why. I mean, and so supporting biofuel is a way to support produce of, 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 of oil seed in, in Europe. That's it. A powerful lobby in Europe. Okay, no, that's a that's a reasonable uh, that's a reasonable answer. Um, it is nine fifty nine and thirty seconds, and I really want to respect everybody's time this morning. Um, I want to thank um, both of our presenters, um, and I would also just like to um, tell everyone who's listening in that this entire webinar has been recorded, and the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation including the second part of Sophia's, which uh, she didn't present um, uh, in order to save time, uh, will be made available uh, to everyone who registered for this webinar. Um, so even if you weren't able to see some slides, um, you will have an opportunity to, um, uh, to download those. And if there are uh, some of the rich data that Benoit shared with us all, uh, will also be available for you to uh, look at um, in more detail. So uh, thanks again to both of our speakers. Um, thanks for everybody who tuned in. And um, please, uh, you can uh, keep apprised of uh, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policies work on issues around 
um, high prices, market volatility, and global food insecurity, as well as some of our ideas for how to respond to these uh, challenges at www.iatp.org. Um, thanks again, and um, have a good day, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.